So we're going to be looking at comparisons today. The last one of the series of eight and comparisons in archaeology, looking at the likes of Orkney and then looking at the likes of Cumbria, Cymru and Cornwall, trying to find comparisons has been very diff difficult at times. But what we're going to look at today are sites that don't compare at all. But the one thing that you have in common is their unusuality. Now today we've got eight sites and I'm really hoping that my slides will all work really, really well. And if we're going to look at the unusual and strange, I think that the best unusual and strange sites that we should look at is a fogu in Cornwall. Now, we've mentioned fogus before, and some of them, some of these, fo some fogus in Cornwall you've visited with me, and some of you have visited Souterrains on Orkney with me. And I thought we'd just have one underground duda. And it has to be a fugu, foggy hole, fogu. They were featured, featured in an episode of Time Team. There are 20 known substantial foggy holes in Cornwall, and they're just in Cornwall. That's it. It's where they are. But as a comparison, we look at the brocks of Orkney, Shetland, and northern bits of Scotland. They're unique to there as well. So uniqueness is the comparison. So there's our foggy hole in Cornwall. And do you know what? I was really hoping Pete was with us today because I can't understand these images. But nevertheless, it's something to look at that is unusual. And this is a plan of a foggy hole at a fogu that I haven't actually been down. This is the one at Haligi. And that's a little bit of a plan. Lots of these were found like lots of the other sites or examined or interpreted from the likes of the 1800s. People started to get really interested in weird things and weirdness is sometimes very good. So as you can make out from this little bit of a plan, it says 19th century entrance, entrance made in the 1800s, it was accidentally found because a plowshare fell into a hole in the ground and then they made entrance into this underground system. And you can tell from the scale there, this sort of underground network is not more than just a few meters. And it's very, very interesting. I've not been down there because every opportunity I want to go down there, it's been closed because of bats. Now, this little entrance way down, because of the little break made in the 1800s, that's all modern, steps leading down, and suddenly you're underground. So very, very strange. Interesting because there are other similarities with this and the likes of Orkney with the technique used to roof over the space, known as known as um, corbelling. And the wonderful thing with this is that the stones are really chunky and they've been put together and there's lots of weird things down there as well. So, so as we got that little bit of an image, before I prevaricate anymore, if you need to go to to see this, it, it just a little bit of an overview. This site and these fogus could be described as roofed and walled in stone, complex of passages, and the one at Haligi, the largest and best preserved of these mysterious underground tunnels associated with the Cornish Iron Age. Nice. The purpose of such fogus, in the Cornish language meaning cave, Foggy holes, that's a popular one. We don't really know what they were used for. And it's the same as a broch. We're not really sure about that. We've got 
ideas of what these were for refuge, storage, chambers, ritual, to hide, anything. Lots of sort of to connect with the underworld as being described with some of those souterrains that we find in Orkney. And they date, not to these little sites that we look at today, date from that sort of Iron Age, interesting Lila. But usually these remains of inevitably got something to do with settlement and has got a really deep connection with the landscape. These sites, like lots of the other, like the other seven examples, have got some kind of protection associated with them. So you can't just go in and take anything away. Some are on private estates, but lots of them are managed by government agencies like Scottish Heritage or English Heritage or Heritage in Cymru, i.e. Cadw. The Hilligi Fogu consists of a long, narrow tunnel leading to three sectioned chambers and a window-like entrance, which was dug in Victorian times, as I mentioned. The complex of passages as a roof and walls of stone. It's been inevitably described since the moment it was discovered by accident. And writing back in the 1800s, 1861, People who wrote were either sirs or notable landowners, a Sir Richard Vivian, described the site. Um, he wrote of a comprehensive uh, this description of this site, and he basically described it as a site that was of Celtic manufacture. I'm putting that in this context of its wording. And he described it as a place that they may have actually stored meat because they found lots of bones down there. And with this fogu, they found a vase, a cup-like object containing ashes. So we've got bones being found down there. It's got a, some say it's a ritual significance and they're, they're keeping ashes of people down there. So it's got a, a series of sort of understandings and meanings and this is what I wanted to do today was the unusual. But it has been excavated and in more recent times, in the 1980s, and, and not this one, but another Fogu in Cornwall was excavated by Time Team, who come up with the wonderful idea that they were used to store eggs. Because in one of them, they actually found the remains of really old uh, bits of egg. And, but then again, this is the problem with archaeology is it not that somebody thinks one thing and then they think all these things were used for the same purpose so whilst they examined this site as well strangely enough since it was found because the top of it was breached by a by a plowshare try and say that fast they've not only found and got lots of different interpretations with these types of sites but they found lots of Iron Age pottery and some bits of Roman pottery as well. Very, very rich wares like Roman Samian ware were actually found down this site at Hiligi, Cornwall. But what could it have been used for in the Second World War? To store ammunition. And in a way that adds to the enigma of such a site. Because you look at such sites and you think, well, what could they have been used for in the past? And then you think, well, what could they be used for today? And inevitably, with these types of sites, that they were probably used for different purposes over a long period of time. And maybe the evidence of them being used to store eggs was only one part in the chain of what the buildings were used for. I think a good example of that is that got a little room in the house here, conservatory. This was used, this was meant for dining, and now I've got a whole computer setup. Very short period of time that this 
sort of extension was sort of put on. And in other words, when we look at something like these Fogus in Cornwall, we can have that sense of mystery. And I think it's very distressing sometimes that people always use the word ritual and religion. And I think, well, in lots of ways, they're, they're very finely built. They, they are structurally sound. They've got a nice sense of corbelling for a roof and they've got long lengths of slab that go over as well. And you think, well, was this just made for religion? And maybe that was one phase of what it was used for, but maybe it was used for different things over time. And one of the things, one of the things that me and Bill came across, and I don't think Pat was there, I think she may have been, but when we went into one souterrain, it was that these these things were not used for religion. They were used for isolation. They were used for people to go down and they were used to communicate with mother nature. Interesting. But we shall never know. Even if we find some little evidence, evidences of what these were used for, that may only be one texture of the life's history. And if I was to be Professor Colin Richards from the University of Highlands and Islands given this presentation today, he would say that the smooth stones there on the right indicate this sense of ancient endo skin, sort of the, the heart of mother nature, that, that sort of polished surface that everything has to be pure. But it could equally be that loads of people have been down here over time and rubbed their arms against the wall and hence why it's rather smooth. And do you know what? I'm looking at this and it just doesn't add up with the plan because if you if you look at, I, 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 this is why I wanted Pete, I just thought, I looked at this and I thought, right, that that's, that's sort of leading down, if that leads down this passage here, and then you've got, I couldn't really work this out. So I just thought, got a bit confused. But you look at this and you, you, you again, get that sense of very interesting, very fine ways of creating things, not just as we will see in Cornwall, but various other locations across Britain. And I probably realized that, probably spending a bit too long on this one monument, but it's, could sort of spend a couple of pennies on looking at something that maybe some of you have maybe never seen. I've, I've been visited two Fogu sites in Cornwall and but not this one. And what they do these days, it, it's it's you can't go down there now because there's a gate and the, the gate itself is to stop people going and disturbing the bats. And I think they're pepper strells, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, they, it, yes, it is very restricted access. You can't go in there now and you might be able to go there in the summer. And again, look at that, that sort of deep subterranean world that, that we very rarely see. And, you know, if you ever do get an opportunity to go to Cornwall in the summer, just go down and see these sites. You need a good bonce as well. Uh, this is why I always insist on wearing a helmet. I always bang my head on things as I go down. So quickly, very strange now, we've actually moved to Cumbria, actually. And this is why it's sometimes very difficult to get people asking questions because it, it doesn't make things flow in this type of situation. So do you know what? I thought I want to check a Roman site in here today. A bit of comparison, a bit of sort of strangeness. And one thing, if we want to be honest, Cornwall, Cymru, Cumbria, we're still trying to work it out, Orkney, Orkney. but Roman roads. I, 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 phoned, I phoned our Arnside uh, counterparts tonight and they just said, I spoke to Andy, is in my, my Tuesday evening class. And he said, he said, what about telling them about the Roman road at High Street in Cumbria? It's a thousand foot up. 
And he said, tell him about that. Really? I said, yeah, well. So it, there it is. That's the Roman road looking across this sort of very mountainous landscape. It's very high up. You can obviously tell that. This is a Roman road called High Street. Again, in Cumbria. And we'll just keep that image there while I get a couple of my notes up, actually. Now, High Street in the Lake District. Rough Crag. High Street is basically refers to the name of a fell and the name of the Roman road that crosses it. The Roman road crosses the fell on its journey between two very important Roman forts. The Roman fort of Brucham and the Roman fort at Ambleside, Galava, very high up, situated in one of the quieter areas of the lakes. I don't think I'll get up there on this type of day. The high street range has quite gentle slopes and it was these characteristics and a flat summit, plateau, which persuaded Roman surveyors to build their road over the fell tops. You think about it, main, main navigable routes across the fell tops. Across, it's very, very interesting to think of that. But there's a good reason for that. Not only can you align roads quite clearly in upland areas and you can stay away from the valleys which would have been densely forested at the time densely wooded and marshy thus making them susceptible to ambushes well there would be very few people living there anyway and you start to think well it, 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 that's that's the way romans did things they, they like to follow ridges but very interesting it's is very very um, high up and it's it's also a place that they used to have fairs up until the 17 1800s and they used to they used to race horses up there as well this is Cumbrian people they're very they're very different and I, I thought I thought yes this was actually a good call a very very good call and so it, it says some other things about here, sites of golden eagles and all the rest of it. But let, let's just sort of try and keep to the archaeology, actually. And let's look at a few images. So we've got that beautiful view, High Street um, towards Harterfell and Blair Water. There's Blair Water there. And there it is. There in front of you, it's you, you can clearly see the road and you think you, you think there's nothing up there and there was probably nothing other than trees up there in the Roman period. And Andy said, he said, well, um, if you want to tell him something unusual, why don't you visit the wonderful Roman fort at Hard Knot? And I just thought, let's not have too much Roman tonight. But it, good, good point. The Romans built strange things up in Cumbria that people can't really work out why they're there. They're there because they're there. Quote from 1917 as the British troops marched into Damascus. And again, the unusualness of creating this road and lots of other Roman roads across Britain. Lots of the finest Roman roads in Britain are in some of the most remotest areas. And there are paved tracts of Roman roads still out there which have been discovered and still some to be discovered even to today. And there is the road now. And perfect for walkers. Again, these sites that we look at are accessible and they're used and loved and, and they're seen. But I'm sure the Romans probably did the same as what we do today. Probably use these routes in the summer months because whatever road surface you've got is going to be very icy and very treacherous in the winter months. And again, looking at that sort of, looking at that vista in front of us of, of that sort of wonderful wheeling roadway that would go across these ridges across Cumbria and other strange ridges as well. You know, 
One question, if we want to make a little bit of a quick comparison, is why we get all these Roman roads across Cymru that are in upland areas and they're so inaccessible today that very few people go there. Like the roads referred to as San Helen. There's several San Helens across our land. And again, very inaccessible areas to very inaccessible forts. Again, look at that. I know it's down to the rock now, but you can just sort of make out the alignment and you can sort of make it all going into the distance there, keep it going over and over and over and over. Uh, very, very, very uh, beautiful in the summer, but in the winter, not so. Next. Oh, by the way, the two sites that we've just looked at, I've not been to. I've obviously been to Cornwall a number of times. I've been used to living Cumbria, but I've not been to those two sites. But this is a site that I've been to. And I very doubt that any of you wonderful people have actually been to this site. This is Mosa. Love it. Michelle and I went over there. This is actually a confession. I could lie and say this is in Orkney, but it's not. It's on Shetland. But I wanted to show you a really good example of the, the, the finest of a broch to be found anywhere in the world. And you always get somebody coming back at you saying, you only find brochs in Scotland. Exactly, that's the point. And the one thing that I'm sure was, was being mentioned a few times, how do you build these types of structures? Where do you find the material from? Are you blind? It's in front of you. It, 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 it's there, it, it's, you can pick it up like lollipops on the floor that somebody has just dumped, you can pick them up. And, and these are slabs and perfect building material, perfect. But you read about Mouser and there's a nice little tale about it. There's lots of little tales. And let's go into that. It's very near the coast today. I saw, a, I saw a reconstruction of it earlier on. I shouted at the computer so much. I thought, no, I don't want to see this because they've used, they've reconstructed a different site to be this one. And I thought, no, mouse is mouse. It also come, it also takes us into the Iron Age. And in a way, you think about the Fogus, you think about this site, and you think about the Roman road. They're all around the same time, the Roman period, Iron Age, as it sort of interlocks. It's a round tower. And again, Enigma, like our wonderful fo foggy sites and Enigma with the road. This has got a bit of an Enigma. You think you know what it is, and then you don't. You think you know why, and then you don't. Now, it's the tallest brook still standing and among the best preserved prehistoric buildings in Europe. Upstanding prehistoric buildings in Europe, I've got to say that. It is thought to have been constructed around 2,100 years ago. One of over 500 brocks. They, they can be found as far south as Stirling, but they're mainly in the north of Scotland. So you can only get to you can only get to this wonderful brock. And let's sort of show you where it is a second. And we go and wonderful aerial view. And it's if you go there. This is the island of Shetland, mainland Shetland, and Sandwick. And there is the island of Mousa, just underneath the sea. And we stayed at Sandwick, and we had one of these like dormer places we were staying in. And you could open it and you could look over to you could look over to Mouser. It was it was wonderful. And we thought we're gonna go there, and we did. It was lovely. Lovely, wonderful site, beautiful. And it there, there it is, that, that gives you an idea. So again, if you follow the curse of this part of Scotland with these brocks and Orkney and Shetland. And, oh, amazing. Shock and awe. Now, you could think, you could, you could say maybe that this site itself may have been rendered on the outside, but there's an archaeologist who works on Shetland called Dr. Simon Clark, and he reckons that they were they didn't have render on the outside. And he says that because he's excavated a number of sites on Shetland and he, and he they had render on the inside, but they didn't have render on the outside. Uh, it, 
it, get very confused by that because the render would be pushed out on the inside by by the rain. But, he, but he's quite convinced that there's no render on the outside. And it's basically because if you put render on the outside because of the heavy rain, it'll just be washed off. But anyway, anyway, so saying a little bit more about this this site this site itself positioned on a flat rock. You you could see the the flat shelf of the rock earlier on. And strangely enough, it does look impressive. It's very impressive. But it's the smallest rock that ever existed. Well, wrong. It's one of the smallest rocks that ever existed in what we're talking about. And as well as one of the thickest wall bases and smallest interiors. So you just think that this standing today Old language, 44 foot, modern day language, 13.3 meters in height. Probably stood about another one, one and a half, two meters. So probably, probably no more than about 15 meters in height. But you think about, you know, what the big ones, what size the big ones would have been. And it was probably because they were larger that they collapsed. Now, because it's so isolated and you need to go over there in a, in a boat, it, that's why it's so well preserved. And basically, when you go inside that little doorway you're looking at, once you go inside, there's an open area and you look all the way up. It's like, it's like going to see one of those great chimneys and you look up and it's a great, you know, empty space. It looks a bit like that, but what you do see is a staircase an intramural staircase. And, and that staircase goes into little zones within the wall, little sort of floors. And you, um, it is the only block which is complete nearly to the top. It's made of dry stone, no mortar has been used at all. The entrance is on the west side, but unfortunately has been altered. The original passage is five meters and still has an original bar hole but it's been slightly altered over time we've we've just been we've just been joined by ellen so thanks for joining us ellen got a bit thrown there we will look at it in a moment so i'm just going to do my little bits of notes inside a hearth and floor tank can be seen in the central space what I'll do, I'll get you the image on as well. And so we got that there. The entranceway has changed and they altered the height so that Victorian gentlemen and gentlewomen women could get into the site. It was actually a lot lower, would have, which would have been a lot better for keeping the heat in. And that there you go through where that woman with the green coat is on, and that gives light into the little pods and the sort of ex ex internal intramural staircase inside. There's several sort of staircase um, areas and a really good staircase going to the top, actually. Now, what I'm going to do, we'll, we'll look at some of those images in a moment, but what you can see is that you can see a central half, a floor tank, and there is a a low stone bench around the base of the inside wall, which you can clearly see. The broch went through a number of stages of occupation. In its original condition, it may or may not have contained a wooden roundhouse resting inside the building. So you can, and maybe there would have been wooden floor levels all the way to the top. Others argue that that never, never happened. That never happened at all. And people actually lived in the walls, but if it would have rained, that fire would have gone straight out. And then eventually what they would have designed was a very low lying stone structure in there, which would have been another phase. But the problem is when we think about these buildings, it's very, very difficult to work them out. Very, very difficult to work out what happened within. Bill, Pat and I have had conversations with archaeologists about this and some would say that there was floor levels in them, some would say there was just one floor level in them, others would say there were no floors in them originally and 
other times they were divided and subdivided. That's another lecture. I can't really spend too much time on that. But there are up to six levels of galleries inside the wall, sort of, sort, sort of different sort of voids inside the wall for storage, for sleeping and all these other things. Now, again, these are, these are very, very beautiful sites. Let's just look at the images for a little bit. And as I, the, the, pro the problem is, the problem is what I'm trying to attempt today is, is trying to look at eight sites. So it should all have an hour dedicated to each of them. But to give you a nice little overview of these things, it's sometimes always best to sort of peer through a, a few images to sort of give, give, give that sort of overview of things that you've never seen before. And again, look at that, that sort of to give light into the stair as you sort of go up, wonderful. And I gotta be honest with you, when I went in there, it felt, it, you had a good feeling. It, 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 it felt all right, you know? And with some of these buildings, um, if you're describing, if you're describing this having, this having a roof, this, this is a um, Scousman ledge here, which would have held the beams to create an apex of a roof or another floor level. But as you can see, there's no other indication of any of the floors. So again, this is a mystery. The, the, this is like Fog Hills is, is, is again a mystery, but it is beautiful. Um, people on the top there giving you an idea of the height, conical shaped, and you can only wonder originally what these sites looked like. Opposite, when me and Michelle were wandering along the coastline, we, we had an absolute wonderful time when we went to this wonderful site. And what, I'm what I need to do a minute is just check what Ellen seemed to go come and go, actually. That's a bit of a shame. I just uh, do that. One thing on the, op on the mainland where we were, sorry for that interruption on the mainland where we were there was a ruin broch that would have been much bigger than this and it looked out the mainland broch looked out to this one and brochs usually have that sort of intercourse that sort of that communication and this is what bill bill and i would have seen when we looked at the broch at gurness and You've, you've also got, um, I get the name of the one on the opposite side, level on, on Rousey, mixed up with another side, it's Midhow, isn't it? And that brock there, it looks out over to each other. So the, lots of these brocks communicate. Again, there's another link there, communication roads, buildings communicating. Again, looking down there, and you can see this little ledge there, can't you? But as I described, again, beautiful. As that entrance way there, as you look out, you can imagine that would be a lot lower and that would be a lot lower would have meant that it would have been a lot warmer inside this building. Again, it looks very damp in there, doesn't it? And you start to think, well, surely it was rendered on the outside. And again, was it? And then you start to work out, did people actually live in here? Difficult to say. Again, looking more at that. Now, what we're gonna, what we're gonna, where we're gonna go next, folks. Again, we've, we've moved, we've moved to another site. We're actually gonna be looking at this wonderful object. He's gonna be quiet, you know, isn't you love it? At a muter. Nice to have you joining us, Ellen. This object, this, 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 this wooden object. And we're in Cymru now. A very unusual object. And I said, I said to Michelle, give me some unusual sites that, that maybe we could look at in Cymru. And she said, what about that wooden thing that was found in the Rhondda Valley, M Maddy Valley? And I thought, oh, yes, that. Look at it. It's wonderful. And if we show you that, hang on a minute, there. It's a bit of timber that was found not so long ago in, in the Rhondda Valley, because there's two Rhondda Valleys. There's Rhonda, um, Rhonda Maur and Rhonda Back. This was found in the Rhonda Back, which is the Ferndale and Mardi Valley. And and what this is, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about this now. Let, let's, let's go with my notes. Let's tell you a little bit more. This itself is a 6,000 year old oak carving, is among Europe's oldest. 
Now, the reason why this we're comparing this with all those other sites, and it, 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 we don't know what this is. Again, it's an enigma like everything else that we've looked at. So a 6,000 year old timber carved with a concentric oval pattern and zigzag lines recently discovered in the Rhonda Valley is thought to be among the oldest decorative wood carvings known from Europe. And if we want to compare this with, with the other stuff that we've been doing, this has survived as well. Now, this, this was found by an archaeological organization called the Heritage Recording Services during the construction of a wind farm near Mardi. And it's 1.7 meters long. It's a 1.7 meter long timber and was preserved partially because it was found in waterlogged peat together with 11 other unmarked pieces of wood. Interesting, what are they? With one end apparently deliberately rounded and the other tapering slightly. The timber has been interpreted as a post. Really? What type of post though? Possibly marking a locally significant site or a tribal boundary or representing a votive offering. Can we think of some other things other than votive offerings, please? Ra radiocarbon dating has placed this to a staggering nearly 6,270 years ago, and it's still with us today. So this takes us to the late Mesolithic into the Neolithic period, you know, so over 6,000 years ago, amazing. Most finds from this period consist of stone tools. So to have a decorative carving on wood, no less, is very exciting. I would say absolutely amazing. We all put bets on its age and nobody would imagine its date. This period marks the transition between the landscape being heavily wooded and a landscape changing to sedentary settlement, permanent settlements that we eventually saw across the landscape. The timber was found by a stream edge on a small flat plateau then as it was. And if it is a post, it was probably marking something, maybe a sacred site or a pool or a nearby hunting ground. There is an ancient um, lake bed nearby. And this could have attracted animals and could have been a marker of some point. This is where the animals come to or could have meant anything. And the designs on the wood are very similar to designs on Neolithic pottery and designs found at the chamber at Barclodiad Igaris on Anglesey. Due to the rarity of such decorations, surviving on the ancient timbers or decorations from this time, it, it's something that must be very much cherished. And again, there's that sen sense of wonderment. We wonder if the lines could have been created by accident, but we now know that they've been created by the hand of man. As the timber is about 100 years older than the deposit in which it was found, this may suggest that the oak timber had been brought to the spot deliberately. So in other words, this timber had been felled 100 years before it had been put in that position. So it may have been used for something else. And somebody said, instead of the marks on there actually having the significance, they may have actually been somebody casually whittling into the wood. But it is made of oak. And the last thing I knew, it was being conserved by the York Archaeological Trust. And I, the last thing I heard was that I may have actually ended up back in Cardiff. I'm not exactly sure. Can you show us the picture again of the real wood? Yeah, let's show you that again. <laughs> So there you go, you got that. And you could just see it faintly there. That's where they found it. There's lots of wind farms up there, but look at that. Are you impressed? Ooh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> now, I'm glad you're excited about this because I'm excited about this as well. I've always been excited about it, but the problem is 
let's not get on a political high ground, but we don't make enough of these unusual things that are being found. And this was found very recently and very few people know this is there. But then again, this is like the other sites, you know, High Street in Cumbria. I didn't know that existed, the weird Roman road up there. I know people know about foggy holes, but not many people go to a Haligi. And you, you start to think, well, you know, some of these are hidden gems. People don't go to Mousa because they can't, because you need to get out there by boat. And that's where it is. What you can see on the map, they were they were building these, these wind farms and the image that you can see, they were clearing an area to put some kind of elect uh, electrical charge substation for the wind farms. And that's where they actually found them by, by total and utter chance, by, by complete accident. Uh, can you put the wind farm uh, view again? Yeah, we're going to go back to that. There you go. Mardi Ronda. This is Treherbert. And that's the oh. bigger Ronda. And Mardi's the other one at the top of the valley. And there's lots of things right. up there. There's, there's, a, there's a wonderful castle up there as well. Well, when I say wonderful, to me it is, but there's no walls there, but it, it's the site of a native castle. And you've got wonderful monuments up there. And we go and pick those um, Winburys. Beautiful. Anyway, Pat, you know, we've got four of the sites to look at and we've got 20 minutes to do it. Okay, go. Go. <laughs> now, we're, we're actually back in Cornwall. We're back in Cornwall. And I just, I just thought, well, what do I look at in Cornwall, which is different? And I thought, well, one of the reasons people go to Cornwall is because it is different and there's lots of carvings and there's lots of spirals marked in rocks and there's lots of wells and sacred areas. And I thought this, I thought this would be really good. So I haven't got many images of this because you can't really show much of the same thing. If you go to the burial chamber, it's not Vaclod the other Garrus, it's Brinketli D. If you go to Brinketli D on Anglesey, there's something like this inside the burial chamber. It's really faint, but there's something like this. And these types of spirals are found all across Britain. And you don't know why. It, it's, it's, it's again, you, you look at these and you think, why is the same thing being recycled all the time? So there's where it is. You, so you've got Tintagel and that's a little bit more of a close up. So we've got this site We've got another three sites to look at, and one is also a stone carving at the end. But the last one, the last image that we're going to see today <clears throat> is part of one of our Christmas recordings that we're going to be making available for you guys to have something to watch over Christmas. So anyway, back to, back. To, we'll keep that one and we'll, we'll tell you a little bit. So. Show us the one right before that. There was um, something. You say where it was, it, the map? Ah, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's just, just, just go back again. Let's just show you that. I'll just, there it is. Tintagel tre, um, tre Devi. So if you type in, when you get off here today, you you type in Tre Devi, uh -huh. and you type in, well, you, well basically the, the exact description. So if we go back to there, it's, it's, it's known as, the Rocky Valley Maze. It's only small. It's only small. So you can you can imagine. Sorry, Pat. You can imagine American tourists <laughs> in this Rocky Valley Maze. But it's a carving. It's a carving in the rock face. That's what we're talking That's about. It's a carving huh? in the rock face. It's brilliant. It's, it's, it's not it's not very big at all. And and just that there's not we don't know a lot about them. So this this carved maze. And there are two of them can be found in Rocky Valley near Tintagel. Hmm. There are two such rock carvings on the rock face behind a derelict mill halfway down the valley. Hmm. There is some debate as to the origin of the rock carvings, as there always is with rock carvings. Because unless you they're out in the open and there's a nice bit of patina or a bit of calcite or a bit of cover on them, it's very difficult to date. But the most appealing suggestion is they are truly ancient. Well, it, you would like to think so. Dating back to the Bronze Age. So it might be 
2,500 years old. This idea is based on the fact that similar style carvings of this era have been found in Galicia, in good old Spain, which have been dated. Given the state of preservation and tools required to carve the mazes, others claim the mazes are actually probably from the Iron Age. So they're not Bronze Age, not 3000, they're probably from probably 2000 years ago. Another opinion is they are later still and date back to the time the mill was built. So you can imagine somebody's thinking, right, I'm gonna carve a little bit more of my maze out there. But no, the thing is, whatever date these things are, there's a massive sense of enigma with them. You think, why did they carve them? And then you start to think, well, why not? Why, why shouldn't they have carved these things? Why shouldn't they be part of our wonderful history across our land? And again, that design is, 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 very, is very popular and, and very much, very much something that's repeated over and over again. And it happens to be in this wonderful place of Cornwall. So three other sites. Let's see where the images take us. So now we've done two in Cornwall. Where are we going next? So let's again look at that. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful they are. So you've got you've got that there. And the the recycling circle of life, the, 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 the those wonderful knot designs from the, the, the period of early Christianity and, and so on and so on. But again, we like to carve these, the maze is, is a symbol across the planet. It, it really, really is. Next, haven't we already done stone circles, but there's something I didn't do when we were talking about stone circles. And we've, we've now gone to Cumbria. So if I show you where this, this one actually is, look at, look at these, ooh, there. It's, it's, it's a place known as a Burke Rig. And the reason why, oh, we don't want to go there yet, but you recognize that, Pat. This is Burke Rig. And at Burke Rig, there's lots of weird things like weird memorials. And if any of you know where Burke Rig is, they will know it's near a place called Ulverston. And Ulverston is inland, as you've made out where Burke Rig is. And this very rich man built a lighthouse in the middle of the landscape. So, and you start to think, why did he do that? And there's a point to this. Why did he do that? Why was this built? And then you think, why were these built? And even in living memory, this lighthouse being built and the other monument, you start to think, why did they need to do these things? They did them because they did them and they did them because they wanted to get people off the street. They did them as a form of employment, all these different things. So let's just, let's just go to, Burke Rig, Burke Rig Stone Circle. And we use those terms, the other name for it, Druid's Temple, Druid Circle. Again, we've gone into the Bronze Age. Burke Rig Common, two miles south of the wonderful town of Alverston. And if anyone knows anything about Alverston, think Lauren Hardy Museum. There you go. And it dates from approximately 1,700 years BC. And again, why, am I, why have I chucked a stone circle in you? I've chucked a stone circle in you because it's an unusual stone circle. There's evidence that there's, there's multiple stone circles there. That there's one stone circle, there's another stone circle around the outside, another stone circle around that as well. And the, the outer measuring 26 meters and 15 stones and the inner being nine meters wide. So 26 meters wide and nine meters wide diameter, we should say, with 10 stones. And 1.2, limited excavation within the inner circle in 1911, found an upper and lower pavement of cobbles. Below the lower layer of cobbles, five cremations were uncovered. Three pits, one on a layer of cobbles and one covered by an inverted urn. A second excavation, 1921, produced a few small stone implements, which the excavator thought might be a pestle, a pallet, and a piece of red ochre. 
and which might therefore have had a ceremonial use. And can you see what I've done there? A stone circle that had something to do with burial and not ceremony originally, or the other way around. And when we think about stone circles as a massive enigma, we think we know why they were constructed. We want to know why they're constructed, but we will never know. And again, the best example, stone circles, Avebury, Stonehenge, and people argue why they're there. Solstice, midwinter sunrise, and all these other things. And, and then overnight you get somebody excavating a site like this and say, actually, they did something else with it than, than what we think about with Stonehenge. And again, the other thing as well is, the other point to be made here, is that stone circles, like when we think of when, when we think of these these foggy holes, like souterrains, underground chambers, and so on, we don't we don't really know why they were built. And even if we did, they would be used for different things over time. It's like a chronology. So, Pat, you're a good example. Once you were a child, you went to school and then you went to college, you, you, you taught and then you got married, you had children. You've got all these different roles in life. And it, it's, it's the same with these stone circles and it's the same with these underground chambers and all these other things. Nothing in history is ever fixed. Nothing ever stays the same and uses always alter. And where we're going to go next? Let's Can see you show us the map again where this is? Yeah, that's what we're going to do. And <laughs> so, where is this stone circle? Where, where's somewhere. my little map? Hang on, it's there somewhere. There, Burkrick. Ah, ah. Oh, Basically, my. down down there is Wal Walney Island, and then you've got the likes of Barrow and Furness. And I used yeah. to live in that place called Millam. And then mm -hmm. over here, you've got a place called Arnside. I used to live there. And mm. this landscape is completely full, completely full of these stone circles. Remember when we did the stone circles? Do you know what? I'm so pleased I didn't do this one when we did stone circles. But there, there are lots of these sites everywhere and lots of enigmas. So lastly, before we go on to the other two. And again, you're looking at that. And what you can clearly see is an inner circle and an outer circle of stones. The outer circle of stones are not well preserved. And again, another indication that this site was used over a long period of time. Nothing is ever fixed. No meaning is ever fixed. Not one building has the same purpose or principal understanding from the day it was constructed. If these sites are used over thousands of years, even hundreds of years, not only People change, but monuments change. And we're going to go into a TARDIS. This. Oh, come on, Pat. Where is this? Come on, Orkney. Orkney, yes. But where? It's a Fogo, isn't it? It's, yeah, it isn't. It's not a Fogo. It's, it's like a suit array. This is mine how. Remember, oh. we, we went down there and we had to go down. Yeah? Yep, yep. And Clive, <laughs> Clive dropped the key and we had to get tongs to get the key out. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. We nearly had to pay about 10, 20 quid for a new key for the thing. But anyway, this itself is an underground chamber. And this, like all the others, is an enigma, a huge thing that we don't really understand. So we've got six, we've got six seven minutes to do this site and the last one. So what we're going to do is if I... If we, if we go here, right, let's show everybody where this is, because I know there's Ellen shouting at the screen at this minute. It's going, where is this? Where is this? So what we're going to do is, there it is, Mine How. It's on Orkney, Mine How. And just show you, look at that. You go down, down these stairs, and it's, it's, it's a really weird thing. It's, it's an underground world, excavated by Time Team. And let's let's tell you what we know in the dying moments. Ooh. Thank you. 
at our that drink. Mine now is an Iron Age suturing. Have you noticed lots of these weird things come from the Iron Age? Man-made chamber dug six, over six meters in depth inside a large mound. So it's probably constructed large mound around it. So it is found in a place known as Tankerness, mine how, not mice how, mine how, not mid how, mine how. Three different sites. Right. And the origin of how is thought to mean barrow. So it, it's, that's what a how is. But we really don't really know what the word how means because there's lots of them as I've just mentioned. So it dates back to about 2000 years and it's, it's, it's dated to the same time that lots of brocks are being constructed. And what there is, there's 26 steps leading to a floor below. So from the top, number of steps, cavity, number of steps down below, and you've got this wonderful corbelin in there as well. And when you get down to the bottom, I can remember they would send you down to the bottom and they would turn the lights out and then they would say, right, how do you feel now? There's a chamber at the bottom, it goes down into a chamber and is very strange. It's, it's like a cistern-like drop, which, which is nine meters from the steps you drop in. It was very strange, that, the little steps leading into it. It's all made of dry stone. And the discovery is really interesting. It was first discovered in 1946. Lots of these sites, as we said, were discovered by accident in more living memory and misidentified as an Iron Age Bruch. After the 1940s, excavations were finished. Mine How, M-I-N-E, Mine How, was covered over and left untouched and nearly forgotten for 50 years. And Douglas Patterson, a farmer who owned the land at the time, rediscovered the site in 1999. Time team went there as well. He removed material that had fill, been filled in during the intervening years and built a small wooden entrance over the opening. We've seen that. He built stairs leading down into the chamber and allowed visitors inside. 2000 was when time team got there. And I think I've been to this site, I, and, it's, it, and you just think time. T I can remember when we went there; the the owner was still talking about the time team visit, and it was it was really weird. And they further excavated the landscape and explored the landscape. And in order to work out how it had been built, time team had a small replica built nearby. I remember they built a replica; it was really interesting. And we saw the replica as well. We went in there, and they closed the door on us. I ended up with. You, I ended up with you, Kathy, and I think Clive. We went in there for a little bit. It was very strange. And Bill, Bill, like a coward that he is, came in last. <laughs> so they found out around this, they, they, they found a ditch and that was excavated. And again, listen to this last sentence on this and we'll show you some images and we'll go to the last side. No firm conclusions have been made about the age or the purpose of mine how. We're not really winning today, are we? Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, the, the big comparison is all these mixture of sites is that we don't really know what most of them were used for. Even the Roman road. Why are they building a Roman road up there like that? Answer. So, again, going down these steps, these these 39 steps and and again, beautiful and way it's cobbled. Not these sites are really damp inside and you start to think, hang on a minute. They're still very much as they were. Why are they still really damp? They must have been damp. Look at that. So you, you've got these two. As you go down, you, you've got these steps going down. And then you've got a little like niche that has got like a cobbled area. As you go down, another little area, nice little bit of a cobbled area. And Michelle's, Michelle's going to say she wants me to take her there the next time we go to Orkney. <laughs> so she uses my lectures as a shopping list for places that she wants to visit. So this is... When they when they was originally found in the 1940s, they they like covered it over with timber and stuff, and then they come down in 1999 and built that nice little shelter over it. And finally, we go to here. And you know what? I'm not going to show you where this is, because this <laughs> is this is part of what's going to happen over Christmas. Um, in a couple of weeks, me and Jessica are going to sit down. And we're going to discuss some weird things in archaeology and that we're going to record pre-record that and it's going to go out over Christmas to give you some viewing stuff if you get bored of your family over Christmas. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So th this this itself is a rather interesting site. And what's interesting about it, let's, let's tell you a little bit of background. Taron Dyson. Now it's, it's the place of the holy well or sacred spring. And very, very few people have actually been there. But if you do ever get to go there, what you do see is you do hear a little bit of spring water and on the way there, there are these, there's these bell pits. So Michelle had the idea of pushing me into one of these bell pits when we went to the site, because they're these, they're these weird pits in the ground that sort of are, are small at the top and widen out. And they were used for people to extract coal. So you'll be very careful when you go there. Well lit day, a group of people who know where you're going. So when you get to this site, you can see a rock face. You can see some spring water coming out. And as you get close to it, you can see some carvings. And you know what? This I'm going to answer questions on everything else we've done today, but not this one, because it will spoil it for when I discuss this. But we'll look at a couple of images, and then, amazingly enough, we've we've come to the end. But what you can see, all those little images, don't they look very interesting? Spooky images, these spooky faces that look out at you. And look at that. Now, the dates, the dates with these, do they go back to the Iron Age? Could they have gone back to the Iron Age if, if the rock is forever move, uh, forever shedding its skin and, and, and it's eroding and so on? But it's nice to think of the date. Taran Dysant. And look at that wonderful saintly figure. Mm -hmm. So you can't see the saintly figure on the image I've just shown you, but you can see this sort of image as a side on uh, actually the all the images if you put them together would be the area of twice the size of my monitor screen in front of me but they're they're slightly spread out but they're just in one area and i really like that sort of floating ghostly figure amongst all these wonderful images and do you know what that'll be a nice close to eight comparison lectures and I'm going to mention next week that those are continuing um, we're going to be looking at um, Roman and Iron Age sites and we'll begin look, looking at various comparisons with forts and various um, civilian sites and then we'll be looking at some Iron Age sites and see how all, all this goes together with Orkney and various different evidences and so on. That's what we're going to be doing starting next week. But what I'm going to do, that image is the one behind me and I would like to stop the share and what we're going to do, Pat, seven sites, not the last one. If you want to ask anything, ask it now. No, I really enjoyed it. I'm going to look it up on my phone, so I'll know even more. <laughs> Cheat. So you should. <laughs> so you should. All, all, all these, all these sites, I want you to look at. That's why, that's why I've told you about them. Goff, anything? No, I was really interested. Some wonderful images, and the whole series you've done there. These eight lectures on the the three C's. Um, very good indeed. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that, Goff. It, it's, it's been fun, and s sometimes it gives me a bit of a, a relax from, from, from everything else, to be honest with you. It, it's really good. Thank you for that, Goff. And it's been great having you along, and we'll, we'll see you in eight weeks. And it, it's, actually, it's actually ten weeks, because we've got, the, the, we've got two weeks off on this one. So what we're going to do is ask everybody to unmute and... Ellen, you caught this at the end, but you will certainly have an opportunity to see the recording. So I don't know if you want to say any, anything, Ellen, if, if you want. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry I was late. Don't worry, it's fine. Uh, can I just ask a general question about everybody? Uh, albeit, I really enjoyed all the archaeology and that. When I try to get on Zoom meetings for another system, um, all I get is that twangy metallic voice on it. Right. So, Jews, does anybody know why that's happening? Because I'm I'm missing quite a lot of dental CPD meetings because I can't get the the, vo the voice coming through properly. Uh, no, the answer is headphones, darling. Right. Okay. I'll try to do that. Yeah, but ba 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 basically, your 
your audio port is different from your your main audio excess. So if you've got, if you basically get some headphones which do the job of a speaker, but if you're just listening, then a good old set of headphones, 10, 15 quid, get, get, invest in something which is better than okay, something that you get from home bargains, yeah. Yeah, and I'll do my best tomorrow, but I've got one meeting at 10.30 for an hour. Oh, what, 10.30 to 11.15, and then one at 19.30 to 20.30 tomorrow. So that completely clashes with you as well. If you, so, well, you, you could do a bit in the afternoon, a bit in the afternoon, a bit in the morning, that's fine. Yeah, okay, cheers. It's, Hello, everybody. It saves you get jumping on the train, don't it? Yeah, yeah. It's be right. quicker, actually, but Bill... Yeah, we've been to so many places today, Carl. I got lots of questions, but obviously I'll have to confine myself to two, if you don't mind. One serious and one more humorous. So we'll we start with a serious one to start with, okay? When we were um, in Orkney, we visited two souter rings, which um, weren't far below the surface, but were big enough to hold a number of people. And we speculated where these could be storage chambers as well, even for preserving food, for instance. When, we, when it comes to mine, how, that's totally different because it's vertical, basically, and it's marketed, if you remember, as the mystery of the 29 steps. You go down 29 steps, and then it, it, as it goes down further, at that point, it turns abruptly at 90 degrees and goes down again to the bottom. And once you get to the bottom, it's small enough just for three or four people to stand shoulder to shoulder, and that's all. So I can't see that as a suitor in at all for storage, but he must have had some other uh, purpose, and we speculated whether it was a place to commune or even a prison, a punishment cell, or whatever. That's the serious part to think about. Mm. Can I just now, jump in there quickly? I had to put up with being down there with Kathy moaning in my ear <laughs> and um, having to put up with Clive. That was great. Well, wonderful experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, other, the, other, the other point is um, when we were in Orkney again, um, we went to this little wonderful little um, hamlet called Twat, and it's a part of the tourist industry. But you can go in the shops there and you can buy mugs with Twat in them, Twat in them, tea towels, mugs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we thought this was unique, but when you show the picture of um, Shetland and Musa Brock in particular on that same map, there was another Twat. So there's one in Orkney and one in Shetland. I thought I put the record straight about that. <laughs> so there's more than one twat. Can I, can, I, can, I just, can I just comment? I've been to both of them. And I, I, that's why. And the other, the other thing as well is I can remember when everyone was lined up, poking up, pointing at me standing by the sign, right? Somebody was pointing at you. For me? <laughs> yes. So there's two... A sign that the direction out was pointing directly at you when the photo was taken, twat, and you were there. Yeah, but somebody, are... somebody was pointing at you, which was really weird. <laughs> so it, it wasn't just me, it was you as well. Anyway, so... Okay. Oh, yeah, must go Ro there again. <laughs> Rosamond, Rosamond, go for it. Well, I, I, I've been to that labyrinth in Cornwall, yes. It, it, it wouldn't be what you, you know... Um, as you said something about the Americans would expect it, I fell, I actually sort of fell upon it and found it quite accidentally. But it brought to mind the difference uh, between the labyrinth, which is often confused with a maze, Carl. Mm. Single path to the center of a labyrinth. Mm. A maze is a puzzle with many choices. A bit so of a labyrinth, life. you have to go to the center and come back out. Exactly. So a maze is something different. Exactly. And so I think that was probably maybe tied in with the ancient people it would have been a symbol of their of, of, of things to do in their life, perhaps. And things that we kind don't of understand. With the fogu and the the other places we went today, exactly. and the deeper mysteries and meanings, perhaps, of life. Exactly. Thank you for that. Yeah. And and Pam, keep I'm, keep it keep it brief, darling. And Pam, what I'm going to do? I'm going to um, you have your bit, and I will close, and you stay on behind because I got to have a, a a chat with you. So quickly, Pam, um, tell us what you need to do. Right, I've enjoyed watching and listening and learning, and that's it. That, that, that's fine by me. And what, what I'm going to do is, again, I've enjoyed these, and I, I'm actually coming out with a, 
well, I've actually coming out with three books next year, and which is, yes, we're, we're rewriting the Roman book. So by doing some Roman stuff, we'll get my head back into it. And that, that'll be great. I have really enjoyed your support and I, I've really enjoyed these, these last eight weeks and look forward to those of you next week. So I'll see most of you tomorrow. So Pam, stay behind. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to say good night. Thank you, people, to Pat, Goff, Bill, Ellen, Pam, Rosamond. Uh Carl, can you have two questions, please? Oh, go on, quick, quick. The first one, you did say that you were thinking about uh, changing the time to 7 o'clock, not 7.30. Yes. I, and I can't remember whether it's this one or the one tomorrow night. Point one, okay? Yes. And the quick. second point is, um, I think the newsletters are overdue. Actually, oh, it's, be yes, it's, be it's being question. worked on. It's being worked on as we speak. And the other thing as well is, the last thing I'd like to ask, we, we, I want to do 7 o'clock because... It's an earlier start, and you you guys can get to bed. That's it. Yep, that's it. Yeah. Seven that's all people need to sleep. Seven <laughs> o'clock next week. So I'm going to say good night, Pat, Goff, Ellen, yeah. Bill, Pam. Night. Good night, 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 folks. Night, night. Good night, all. Good night. 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 Thank you very much for watching this lecture. It's been uh, delightful doing the sessions in, in comparison. Next week we'll be doing the wonderful Roman world, comparing different sort of areas of the Roman world and the Iron Age world in Britain. And if anyone would like to join them, www.archaeologycumryonline.weebly.com. Link down below, press down below subscribe and like it'd be really appreciated and thank you very much and always ask if you want to ask any questions thank you <laughs>